we would obviously like to thank all of you for coming out here and supporting this competition, supporting our presentation, um, like this this competition, this uh, team, team, this well, academy, the Stockdale Academy Center. Thank us. you very much. Um, and just to, I know we introduced ourselves in the planetarium, but just to go over it again, I am Michigan Second Class Jackson Hathaway. I'm a political science major, and I'm from Chicago, Illinois. I'm Kyle Beasley. I'm from Austin, Texas. I'm Michigan Third Class Hunt. I'm from London, England. Michigan Third Class Ramirez. I'm from Austin, Texas, Louisiana. And I've been Juan Cortez, the uh, body group, the senior member of the uh, Ethics Debate Team. So thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to have you. Quick question. Olivia, did you compete last year? Yes, I did, sir. I thought so. <laughs> okay. Same here. Uh, big chops, though. <laughs> and as a quick refresher, we have uh, 30 minutes for the initial presentation and then 20 minutes for the judges to ask uh, questions and answers afterwards. So if you guys are ready, we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, and we'll give you a warning at 10, 5, and 1 minute, or 10, 5, and 3, right? Yes, please. Okay. All right. Okay. Excellent. Go ahead. All right. Okay. Thank you very much for coming to this presentation. The team from the United States Naval Academy would like to pre present our case, Spies in Hanoi Hilton, an ethical examination of espionage and resistance. We would like to begin by giving some general background for the context of this case, which takes place during the United States involvement in the Vietnam War. The United States involvement in the Vietnam War began on November 1st, 1955, and lasted nearly 20 years during which 771 people were taken as prisoners of war. The case also examines two major legal bodies of work, the Geneva Conventions and the Articles of the Code of Conduct of the United States Fighting Force. The Geneva Conventions were a series of conventions that were signed between 1864 and 1967, with the bulk of them being signed in 1949. This case examines predominantly Vice Admiral Stockdale's action while uh, taken a prisoner of war in the Hanoi Hilton. He was shot down on September 9, 1965, and spent nearly eight years in captivity, during which the Office of Naval Intelligence and the CIA reached out to him through his wife, Sybil, for a suggestion that he undertake espionage operations in the camp. Um, this began a series of exchanges between him and Sybil that proved crucial to the uh, operations of the United States government in finding out what was happening to the prisoners of war in Vietnam. The relevant Geneva Conventions to this case, we believe, is Article 4, Articles 12 through 16, and Article 17 of the Geneva Conventions relative to prisoners of war. Um, Article 4 categorizes which groups assume protected status, the protected status of prisoners of war when captured. This, of course, is uniformed services, uh, members of paramilitary groups associated with state-backed actors, and following the legal recourse for the Conventions of War, any civilians that follow. Uh, militaries into combat and other groups of that nature. Articles 12 through 16 provide general protections for prisoners of war. So this, of course, is the protections that prisoners of war must be fed, they must be clothed, they must be treated fairly and equitably, they must be allowed to uh, write home, they must be given medical resources, all the things that the North Vietnamese did not provide our prisoners of war, as we will see. And finally, Article 17 uh, prohibits the use of mental and physical torture as a form of coercion for information from prisoners of war, uh, which again, the <coughs> North Vietnamese broke in their treatment of our prisoners of war. Next we go into the Code of Conduct of the United States Fighting Force. It was written in response to prisoners of war actions in World War II and the Korean War and signed into order by President Eisenhower on 17th of August, 1955. It has since been amended twice, uh, but it is the main body of work that denotes obligations for the American service member and their conduct both as lawful combatants and as lawful prisoners of war. The three main articles of the Code of Conduct which we will be examining ethically in this case are the second, third, and fourth. The second article of the Code of Conduct states the American uh, service member's obligation to never surrender of their own free will while they still have the means to resist. The third speaks of their obligations to resist if captured as prisoners of war. And the fourth speaks to their obligations to their fellow prisoners of war um, and the, uh, their obligations to mitigate harm to their fellow prisoners of war if captured. We would like to begin our ethical examination of this case by going over stakeholders that are present in this case that are important to this case. The first, lawful and unlawful combatants, the two of which we will delineate between. The second, non-combatants and civilians, which are related but are not the same as we will explain. Um, 
The third, aid workers, government officials, governments, and multinational alliances, such as the United Nations, uh, who drafted the Geneva Convention. We also want to make it especially clear that within the category of civilians, we are also talking about the families of both American service members and POWs. They are a, a stream of stakeholders in this case, as we see Sybil Stockdale did act as a spy, um, and she has much weight in this case as any other spy. Within our case, we have two primary statuses that we will use to delineate the protected status and the unprotected status of service members. So the protected status um, is given to someone or an individual involved and surrounded by a conflict when they belong to a uniformed military organization or, or an organization adherent to the law of armed conflict and understanding and respectful of and people's innate human dignity. This includes civilians and bystanders and victims. Within the protected status, we have the lawful combatant, an individual who has both the ability as well as the intention and desire to combat. The non-combatant, which is an, in in an individual without the ability to combat, but who has the intent and desire to combat. And then finally, the non-combatant civilian, an individual without the ability, intent, or desire to combat. Um, opposite to the protected status is the unprotected status, whose sole category is the unlawful combatant. That is an individual with the ability, desire, and intention to combat, but without the protected status of being a member of a uniformed military or an organization adherent to the law of armed conflict and respectful of innate human dignity. An important thing to deduce here is also because a lot of the same language is used between unlawful combatants and non-combatants or even protected status, it can be confusing to see where the line is drawn between what falls under unprotected status and what falls under protected status. An important clarification we need to make here is when we talking about unlawful combatants, we are talking about people who are operating outside of the ethical and moral conventions such as the Geneva Conventions that we use to reduce harm and war and protect the, eth the ethics and dignity of human, uh, human nature. And so, whether through perfidious acts or other abuses, unlawful combatants both abuse and operate outside of said conventions and go fly in the face of the principles that we attempt to use to reduce harm in wartime. We will now expand on the two primary written documents brought up in this case, the Geneva Convention and the Code of Conduct. In order to accurately understand that these two, these two documents, we have to comprehend that both of them pretty much aim to do the same thing, and that is create use and bellow principles that allow us to wage uh, a fair and effective war, uh, use and bellow, if you will. Um, we say conduct fair and effective war using the word fair as in uh, we are operating in the same rules, though war may be unequal, it should be fair in that uh, we all know the standards going into it, as well as establish the standards of behavior in war. Well, how the Geneva Convention and the Code of Conduct differ, and differ greatly, is that the Geneva Convention is a document drafted to protect mankind. It's a document opted into by multiple countries, uh, multiple nations. It's a, a document that's meant to provide an ideal. Uh, the perfect, if a war were to be conducted perfectly, it would be conducted by the Geneva Convention. Where, and they also establish the ideal standards of behavior during war for all parties. Whereas the Code of Conduct is an American document. It has American culture, American sensibilities, sensibilities. Its goal is to protect the United States service member in the American war effort, uh, as well as to establish minimum obligations for service members' behavior it's a pragmatic document that sets the base that we cannot violate. So the Geneva is the ideal, whereas the code of conduct is pragmatic. And also talking about ideal and pragmatic here, uh, I would just like to reinforce that we are talking about ethical and moral principles. We're not necessarily talking about guns and butter here because obviously it is in the interest of the United States and all nations in war fighting to have every material advantage possible. We're not talking about a fair war where everyone gets the same weapons or the same equipment. We are talking about a fair war where we, everyone plays by an ethical set of rules that respects human dignity. Whether the balance of forces is equal is irrelevant because that is not a prerequisite for the war to be respectful of human dignity. Two relevant definitions that we would like to delineate from this case is the difference between deception and perfidy as we use it. Deception, we say, is an act of misleading an enemy's own belief and misuse, or using their own assumptions against them to, uh, to adhere to a military goal. Uh, examples of this are disinformation campaigns, such as dropping leaflets on an enemy, uh, camouflage, concealment under reconnaissance, and information warfare. The difference between deception and perfidy, as we see, is that we believe perfidy is an act of treachery or faithlessness that is a deliberate breach of trust and international norms, um, examples of which include espionage, uh, guerrilla warfare when not following the laws of armed conflict, and feigning injury or feigning protected status such as a civilian status in order to gain an advantage in 
And this also ties back to our protected versus unprotected status comparison earlier, in that the perfidious acts rely on the protections and the respect for human dignity in order to be successful. An information warfare campaign may be conducted by armed service members adherent to the laws of armed conflict, but perfidious acts rely on the trust and uh, care of an enemy combatant to be abused in order to gain an advantage. And the best example is the feigning of surrender in order to uh, gain an advantage or the upper hand in combat. So the two main questions from the case that we seek to answer is the first and the second. The first, how do you think the clandestine communications effort reflect the ethos of the code of conduct? Are there inherent tensions and elements of the code of conduct that are present in the case, and how do we approach this pedagogically? The second, given the expectations set forth in the code, what is the moral obligation of the United States government to provide its prisoners of war with purpose, broadly in line with their status as military members? Um, does this purpose clash with their status as non-combatants? Why or why not? And did the clandestine program undertaken by prisoners of war in Vietnam, our prisoners of war in Vietnam, um, give them such a purpose, and was it done in a responsible manner? Were there risks to their lives with it? Now, we will answer the ethical aspects of the two questions in our case by answering these four fundamental ethical questions. Once we can break down these uh, fundamental quandaries, we can go back to the case and then assert our ethical theory to make explicit distinctions. Our first question is spying as a military member ethical. Our second question is can the code of conduct justly ask service members to resist as POWs? Our third question is can the code of conduct justly ask service members to spy as POWs? And then the fourth is what is the nation's duty to these POWs? So to answer the first question that Olivia brought up, the broad answer is no. And the key word there is simultaneous. So you cannot simultaneously be a uniformed service member and also be uh, taking part in spying because of the implications of the lawful and unlawful combatant. And considering that Article 103 of the UCMJ uh, states that you cannot be a military service member and also be spying. And so therefore, if you do decide to spy, it is not explicitly unethical, but you're gonna move yourself from the status of a lawful combatant into the status of an unlawful combatant. And you must do so of your free will and with your understanding. In the case of Vice Admiral Stockdale, in the initial communication, he was clear this is something he's being asked as an individual and not an obligation as a service member, and he proactively took it on of his own volition. And that's a key distinction to make. Uh, it's key to consider the, the individual agency and the difference between uh, your protected status and unprotected status. An implication of that would be that in Vietnam, if you are taking place in spying, um, you will not be entitled to the same protections as a POW should the enemy find out. Another distinction that we would like to make specifically is about reciprocity. We feel that the actions of the North Vietnamese, however foul, however in violation of the Geneva Convention, does not give us any more or less right to then allow spying. Um, as a uniformed military member. Reciprocity specifically, and this is the reason we don't use um, explicit act utilitar utilitarianism in our case, um, is because if they violate, the slippery slope of then allowing us to violate is not in, in lines with how we behave as service members. And just additionally, when we argue about reciprocity, this is not a condemnation of Vice Admiral Stockdale's actions or the actions of the prisoners of war. We are merely saying that to use reciprocity, reciprocity as a justification would be dangerous to the frameworks of human dignity and respect that we are attempting to uphold through the Geneva Conventions and through our ethical interpretation of this case. Can the Code of Conduct justly ask service members to resist as POWs? Our answer to this question is yes. Uniformed militaries can justly instruct service members to resist so long that that resistance is in line with a lawful order that would have been given to them as combatants. Nothing can be asked of a military that a military can ask a service member that is not a lawful order. We specifically would like to say that non-combatants are entitled to resist, not only obligated to by the Code of Conduct, but entitled due to, the, due to the nature of their obligations, obligations that have moral weight. When an individual joins the military, they take on a voluntary obligation. We, so we for example, on here, as well as many people in this room, have sworn an oath, we have signed a code. Uh, there is a degree of our behavior that we say, I will sacrifice for this, and in return, I will be given this. It is a voluntary obligation. And though we feel that that has immense moral weight, um, we think that once people join conflict, they put the lives of themselves into the hands of other individuals. They suffer together. That those voluntary obligations move into special obligations, which have even a more greater and indelible moral weight than voluntary obligations do. Specifically in the Ho Hanoi Hilton, POWs were being oppressed under the same force. The camaraderie there brings it under special obligations to obligations of solidarity under those special obligations. 
So not only can these, the military ask service members to resist, but it is the service members' natural right to be able to express this loyalty and special obligation to each other and to their nation. Uh, the idealism of the Geneva Convention does not necessarily capture this uh, necessity and obligation and the way that the pragmatism of the Code of Conduct does. However, we do think it is important to say that if a military is going to ask for resistance, for example, in the Code of Conduct, they must get informed consent. Much to how you gain informed consent when you join a voluntary obligation, the Code of Conduct should be taught in things like basic training if a service member will be held to that standard once they encounter. The third question that we answered then is, can the code of conduct justly and ethically ask prisoners of war, any service member, to spy? Um, and we say no. The reason for this is because spying is an unlawful action as we set forth. And it would be unethical for any military organization to obligate or order its members to undertake an unlawful action. A government, on the other hand, may ask an individual to spy of their own free will. This, we are not saying is unethical. But the person who undertakes spying then must be given informed consent, must take that obligation and that, um, and that they must take those actions of their own free will and understand that any consequences that befall them are because of their own actions. Uh, of course, we're not saying that spying in itself is unethical. We are not making that distinction. We are simply saying that the United States military cannot order its members to spy because it is an unlawful order. And finally, what is the nation's duty to its POWs? We've talked a lot about the POWs themselves and their actions and what their duty is to their comrades and to our country, especially through the code of conduct. But how does the nation feel obligated back to its POWs? And a lot of this relies on an idea of stewardship. These are the men and women who are fighting for this country who have voluntarily put themselves on the line. And as a part of that obligation that they give to the country, the country has the duty to take care of them both whether it is stateside, in combat, or in a prisoner of war camp. And that this goes back to the voluntary obligations versus stewardship, which is the way we look at the relationship from the, the service member up to the government or the nation, and from the nation back down to the service member. And part of the military's duty to POWs in particular is aiding their survival and resiliency efforts, whether through material efforts such as the operations that they attempted to uh, break out the prisoners and reunite them with their comrades, or through other emotional efforts such as providing purpose, making sure that those efforts are not in vain, that their resistance is not in vain, and they have the motivation and the purpose to continue their struggle, even miles away from home in the most brutal of conditions. And additionally, the continued obligations of loyalty or support, however, does not extend to being ordered to spy. Again, we are talking about the difference between resistance and espionage in the sense that there is plenty of justification both ethically and through the code of conduct legally for resistance as service members and it is a core part of their purpose in a POW camp. However, this does not extend to espionage because of the ethical and protected status distinctions we have drawn. In understanding the stewardship duty of the military to its service members, we would like to bring up and mimic healthcare ethics in that the example for for example, a doctor may have to cut into you to make you better. But in order to cause that immediate harm, they must fulfill beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy, and justice, much in the way that a military must attempt to do those things um, to, toward their service members in order for their service members to then be asked to sacrifice for country. Again, we are asking the mil in many situations, we are asking these POWs to do incredibly difficult, dangerous, and potentially harmful things, but it is in the it is in the line of providing purpose and continuing the struggle for the United States and the United States military, which is why we say that there is an important, you can't look at it specifically and we are asking them to put their lives on the line or do incredibly heinous and dangerous things. We are asking them to do these dangerous things in line with the principle of beneficence. Now we are going to take the ethical questions that we just answered and reapply them to the original questions one and two in the case. Um, the first answer is the POWs knowingly yielded their protected status once they partook, partook in espionage, a type of perfidious deception. We see Stockdale openly acknowledge that um, his protected status was no longer there once he started participating in spying. Should the Vietnamese have discovered he was a spy, it would have been completely within their rights to try uh, Vice Admiral Stockdale and even to execute him um, for his unlawful combatancy. Once they partook in spying, they were no longer protected by the uniform of the United States or by membership entitled to a protected status. 
Spying is an individual act. You go from being a part of a lawful combatant in a protected status to being an unlawful combatant without a protected status. Uh, the perfidy comes in if you expect that protected status while doing unprotected acts, uh, but they did not do so. They knew that they were putting themselves as individuals on the line. They did so with informed consent. Um, the POWs involved with espionage knowingly, willingly, and individually forfeited their protected status, risking lawful execution. Um, as I said before, it is an individual act. They need to know fully the weight of their decision. POWs have obligations to resist, but have no obligation to others or to their military to spy. Spying is an action that they choose themselves. It can never be a lawful order. They cannot make that decision because they believe it is a lawful order. Um, when the men spied and partook in perfidy, they did so at their own risk. Ten minutes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, the nation, such as the federal intelligence agencies of the United States, can ask individuals to spy. Um, for example, the government may say, this will be a great aid to the U.S. government, but it cannot come from the military. Just as much as they're asking, they must then receive informed consent, um, tell them fully the risks that they are going to take on, the onus um, of their individual actions. Um, and they may accept that out of their own individual understanding of patriotism, but they cannot do it because of their obligations to military and crew membership. Uh, permitting resistance is critical to soldier survival and imprisonment. As we talked about special obligations, voluntary moving into special, um, that soldiers have the right to be able to want to resist. This is something that can't be separated from them as individuals and in the way that the Geneva Convention may ask it to be. Um, but they are allowed to resist. The government is allowed to then ask them to continue to resist because of their special obligations. It is just, their resistance is just as critical to their survival as, as many other things. And it might not have, uh, if they had not been permitted to resist or had that resistance, we might not have had seen so many POWs survive today. And finally, the U.S. military had an obligation to devote time, resources, and commitment to the continued resistance of the POWs, providing them with a purpose. The military has obligations to its service members, just as service members have obligations to each other. And the U.S. military did not violate the POWs' protected status by asking them to resist. So we, now that we've really delved into our ethical framework, let's look at the legal applications of this, specifically through the Uniform Code of Military Justice. As we brought up the Code of Conduct, now let's see how this applies to the system by which U.S. military members are held accountable. So the first article we're going to address, in addition to Article 103 and espionage, is Article 92 and the failure to obey an order of regulation. And while this deals with general failures to obey an order or failures to carry out orders knowing of their existence, we're going to see that this is applied in many cases to people who fail to hold themselves up to the code of conduct in the, per in the perception of the U.S. military. Next up is Article 98, which deals with misconduct as a prisoner of war. And this deals with unjustly seeking favorable treatment by captors, which may or may not place your fellow service members in a position of danger. And also, as U.S. military members who hold prisoners of war, mistreating them without cause and violating those own human dignity rights of those prisoners. Article 99 deals with behavior in the presence of the enemy, and specifically we want to narrow in on 99.3, which deals with through disobedience, neglect, or intentional misconduct, endangering the safety of any such command, unit, place, or piece of military property. And the, we expect a potential counter-argument to come from Article 99.3 through the idea that potentially Vice Admiral Stockdale and the prisoners of war were engaging in intentional misconduct, espionage, which, through group punishment, may have endangered the safety of their fellow POWs. And we are going. And in the counter arguments, we will address how we do not believe that this uh, invalidates the actions of the prisoners of war and Vice Admiral Stockdale. And finally, Article 100, which is the compellence or attempted compellence of surrender while still having the means to resist. And this goes directly back to the code of conduct codifying that article into the UCMJ and re reinforcing the idea that of how core resistance is to membership in the armed forces of the United States. So we talked a lot about the prisoners of war in Vietnam and Vice Admiral Stockdale, but there have been several other applications of the code of conduct in the UCMJ to cases in the United States where we have seen the code of conduct applied. And the first one I want to talk about is the USS Pueblo, which was a US Navy intelligence gathering ship that was opera operating off the coast of North Korea when it was attacked and captured by the North Korean Navy. Now, the ship did resist. However, as an intelligence gathering ship, it was outgunned and outnumbered by the North Korean vessels. And after the death of a sailor in the resistance effort, the captain chose to surrender the ship. They were then imprisoned by the North Koreans, where they did offer resistance. However, 
Several of them ended up giving in and giving confessions under torture, which were then used in North Korean propaganda. When the sailors returned home to the United States, a board of review recommended the captain and the intelligence officer for court-martial, saying that they violated the code of conduct. However, these cases were dropped. But the important thing is that the board of review felt that they violated the code of conduct and did not hold themselves to the standards of uniformed service members. And the XO ended up really receiving a letter of admonition in the end for his actions. Secondly, the Farsi Island incident is much more uh, recent to today, where a U.S. Navy riverine command boat broke down in the Persian Gulf and drifted into Iranian territorial waters in the vicinity of Farsi Island. It was then captured after a confrontation with the Iranians where no shots were fired and no combat was engaged in. The lieutenant in command received a letter of reprimand ending his career. However, he did face a UCMJ Article 92. So that means that while he did receive the letter of reprimand, he was potentially liable for much higher consequences. And there was a, a serious question as to whether he violated the code of conduct. Five minutes remaining. Finally, so uh, just to wrap it up, we see how Article 92 has been used to accuse personnel of violating the code of conduct. The code of conduct status is an executive order coming from the commander in chief thus moves it into that lawful order status under the UCMJ, and we can see that applied to personnel who failed to live up to its standards. Articles 98 and 100 reinforce the concept of not surrendering with the means to resist, and Article 99 could potentially be extended to those who spy, if they're spying, places other US POWs at risk, and if we were to categorize that as intentional misconduct. All right, so our pedagogical approach is divided into three phases. The first phase is to make sure we have a great understanding of the basics of the UCMJ and the Geneva Conventions in order to understand the legal implications for armed conflict. Based on that general understanding, uh, we think education should include phase two, which specifically highlights some of the things that we talked about, the unlawful resistance versus lawful resistance that has been talked about extensively in this presentation so that military members know the implications of their actions. And the third phase is to apply phase one and phase two to specific case studies to build a repertoire of examples that people can reference when considering their own actions because every case study is different and will have different implications. So studying cases like the USS Pueblo and the Farsi Island case will aid in service members making more effective decisions in the future. And finally, our counter-arguments slide. So we came up with three key counter-arguments that might be brought up in our case uh, against our position. The first is defining espionage that was undertaken by our prisoners of war as simply reconnaissance or other military, valid military uh, operations. We say that, yes, finding out where an information hub, say, or a main transportation hub, say, would traditionally be military, viable military targets. The method that the prisoners of war found and then disseminated this information to the United States government is more in line with the actions of a spy than, say, a member of a Marine recon unit behind enemy lines marking a position with a laser for a laser-guided munition to, to hit it. <clears throat> the second is that the status of uniformed service members is not transitory. Of course, though concerns may be raised about the military service members' implicit feelings of obligation to their country through the socialization that we undertake as military service members, there is a clear impasse between the demands of military honor and the perfidious deception that they would have to undertake when they become spies. Of course, the shift isn't and doesn't have to be clear to the enemy, but within ourselves, we know that once you transcend the honor and justice that we believe in and hold core to our values as military service members, that you are not acting as a military service member. And thus, both their protective status and their status as a military member and military actor um, changes, and they forfeit that protective status. Uh, finally, our third question is that there are inherent tensions between the code of conduct, uh, articles which demand resistance, and the ones which demand protection of fellow prisoners. We say that though, yes, there is an inherent um, tension between demanding resistance and an understanding that that resistance might bring uh, retaliation by the enemy on your fellow prisoners of war, that it is an undeniable truth of war that we must sacrifice to achieve our mission. In this case, the mission was the resistance that was undertaken by the prisoners of war, and specifically Vice Admiral Stockdale and the other prisoners of war at the time of Hilton. Their mission was resistance, because resistance was their method of survival. And thus, they had to choose their mission over their brethren due to the uh, constitutional paradigm. And just to go back to the second point, this is why our pedagogical approach is so important. Because 
there is a valid concern that as a member of the military who has sworn an oath to protect the United States, even though this request may not be coming from the, uh, a uniformed service member, rather from a civilian agency, they may still feel strong feelings of attachment and feelings that they need to go along with this order, that they may think it's an order. That's why we need to inform them so that they can know what the distinction is and really the implications of their actions they're about to undertake. And to add one more point to the first kind of argument, Stockdale himself recognized his action as espionage and not reconnaissance, which further aids that point. And with that, we would like to see the rest of our time and thank you for your time, and we are open to any questions. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I just have two okay. Okay. First, 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 excellent, and, uh, but a multi layered complex issue. And uh, so I've got I've got uh, really three questions, and they're they're pretty short. Your your argument hinges on the definition of a spy. You did not define spy. You talked about espionage, but you in making your argument, you called the wife of of uh, Admiral Stockdale a spy, and you did not define spying versus other espionage activities versus reconnaissance. So could I hear what your definition of a spy is and what you are hooking into legally that would make that argument? Yes, um, we believe that the definition of spy and the reason we defined it as perfidious deception is because it takes that protected status and it then violates it. You can um, sort of spy, you can do reconnaissance is the idea of like, I would as a uniformed service member, who you can clearly see I'm wearing I may partake in actions to try to gather information from my enemy, um, but a spy becomes if I put on civilian clothing, did not address myself um, as a military member, and then pr attempted to gain that information. It is the betrayal of that protected status. For the purposes of our case, I think we're saying that a spy is any individual who takes place, who takes part in espionage, and that's the spy. That's the definition that we're using for the implications. And for espionage, we're talking about clandestine efforts by not in a non-military sense to gain information at the expense of the nation or organization you are operating against. Okay, and so let's follow that line with the second question. You become a prisoner of war, they strip you of your United States military uniform, put you in clothes that, uh, that is trying to take that off. So how are you doing, uh, or how do you just delineate between clandestine communication and information gathering in support of escape efforts and the argument you're making that that's actually espionage and spy. I, I got it that the enemy might view it that way, but in your argument, is it, what's the difference between those two? Well, I think for information gathering efforts that we would be put towards uh, an escape attempt, for example, we would not count that as spying. We believe that those individuals in the POW camps are entitled to resistance, and part of that resistance is an attempted uh, escape effort. That information that they gather to then to partake in that escape effort is not something that they're um, outwardly giving away for, let's say, aggressive military attacks. You're not giving information about um, how, let's say, the POW camp is fortified so that the POW camp itself can be bombed. Whereas some of the espionage attempts and the espionage that was actually undertaken and successful by some of the members of the Hanoi Hilton were things like, let me tell you where a trans, uh, where a Transmitter. transportation center is where I can then do an offensive attack that is beyond the scope of the resistance of the POWs. Okay. And uh, my final one, and, and have each of you memorized the code conduct? Do you know it by heart? Well, sir, we did over plebe summer. Um, and I think we could recall most of them, but I, I will be honest, I don't think I could word for word in this moment. Maybe an action item to keep close to your heart throughout your career, because nobody's going to hand you a code of conduct. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Just like the alma mater. <laughs> exactly. Uh, just a couple of quick things. What are, your, what are spy organizations throughout the world? What are the roots of the spy organizations? example, Central Intelligence Agency, what was its predecessor? Do you all know? The Office of Chief Services, the OFS. And that was in what? That was a military organization. Uh -huh. uh, so how about MI6? I don't specifically know the origins of MI6. 
military intelligence at MI. Uh, so, and that's true almost everywhere. So, you know, they had, we, people have been gathering information for military purposes in uniform and out of uniform for a long time. So, and they've been in and out of the, the becoming a spy. So they, it's a difficult area. And so, you know, weaving your way through this is, uh, is very interesting. And one thing, one thing I would like to say is that I think, I, I think that is an important point that a lot of contemporary intelligence agencies, especially the ones in the United States, had their origins in military intelligence. However, over time, the way we get, the way we operate our intelligence apparatus has changed. That has also changed the operations we undertake. For example, uh, now having the Central Intelligence Agency and the Defense Intelligence Agency or National Geo Geospatial Intelligence, we have diversified our operations in a way that. That while the division of labor is not strict, Central Intelligence Agency members will and often do gather military intelligence. There is a sense that we are not grouping everyone and all information gathering operations into espionage, and that there is, we are trying to delineate between, for example, an economic espionage effort where we're trying to steal technology secrets for the space program and finding out targets and military objectives in a complex. And I think our case hinges on the fact that the U.S. military recognized that in putting Article 103 into the UCMJ, and so with that addition, that would uh, add an additional layer of uh, complexity and uh, therefore change the exact commitment that may not have been before. Mm -hmm. And to protect the status of our lawful combatants, our uniform lawful combatants, um, we had that sort of delineation between those organizations. If our lawful combatants receive the protections entitled to them, by the Geneva Convention, by the world, and by their innate human dignity, and the fact that they are combating with their uniform on, um, because we have agreed to not con complete perfidious deception within our military specifically. So one might guess that, that we have a, a thing called the Office of Naval Intelligence. Uh, mm -hmm. Works underneath the, the Chief of Naval Operations, and there are intelligence officers based in almost every command. And, and, and sometimes down to the unit level, the, 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 an individual ship has one of the assignments. And you're not then gathering intelligence such that the other, your potential enemy knows what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You're gathering because you don't want him to know what you know. <laughs> and so there is always a clandestine element to the, the intelligence gathering. So if those people from naval intelligence who are out there helping you uh, gather information, however you might be doing that, and how, whatever platform you might be doing, for example, during the Second World War, we sent submarines into very close into beaches to check the landing capabilities of the beaches so that when the Marines came in, they wouldn't get stuck in great huge sand piles. You know, and, and those were all, the, and you know, I guess that we do similar, similar things today. So it, it's always a mix. It's always a mix. And I guess the last one I think is the, there's a thing called intelligence prepar preparation of the battlefield. Um, and if you can do all the preparation in the world, but if you don't get the information to the right place, then it's useless. So is the communication then of that intelligence preparation of the battlefield, uh, is that knowingly, you're sending that back knowingly, or a spy, is that wrong? Perfidy, perfidy hinges on the use of the protected status for that sure. deception. And so when you're collecting reconnaissance, you're not claiming, oh, I'm surrendering, and then outline the battlefield, and then going back, and then using that intelligence. And so that's like a key distinguishing factor is that you're not using a, a protected status as a means of deception, which falls into perfidy, um, versus using typical deception of trying to confuse the enemy and using clandestine communication does not always fall into perfidy because you're not claiming a protected status. You're still uh, a lawful combatant. We believe deception is a completely lawful form of warfare. And the fact that deception plays off of your enemy's assumptions. Um, deception is, for example, if we go to World War II on D-Day, um, we blew up tanks at the closest impasse between uh, France and England, but we did not attack there. That is a type of deception. We're playing off of their assumption, but we are not abusing a protected status to get that information. Um, because we think that if we were to abuse these protected statuses and then universalize that abuse, the need for a protected status would no longer exist. And I think the core is the means. When John McCain gave the North Vietnamese the name of the Green Bay Packers offensive line, that wasn't relying on the Geneva Conventions or any human dignity standards for that deception to work. He, and that's really what we're trying, I think that's what we're trying to get with this answer is that 
creativity is where you're you the means cannot work without abusing that those protections and deception is as you said a critical part of military operations and in, a part of the intel intelligence and information warfare mission but we are drawing the distinction where the means abuse the standards and that's where we start getting into purpose. And one of the reasons we use the word universalization test especially for the code of conduct is because we're using more of an act, we more of a rule utilitarianism than an act utilitarianism. The rule utilitarianism provides this code, a code that must be universalizable um, in order to achieve utilitarian ends. We think if we were to say, like for example, if I was a POW and I was tortured, that I was then allowed to make utilitarian act, utilitarian decisions by myself, that the, the chance for reciprocity would be so great that it could then possibly violate our honor and our code and use and bellow ourselves. Just because the enemy has violated use and bellow does not give us as American service members any right to then do that. I'm struggling with, so, so, so the, it's what the argument you're making is the clandestine means of communication means periphery. Um, so passing the names of your fellow prisoners by a clandestine means to the U.S. government knows is is a violation, and now you are subject to execution because you have been you know, committed so, espionage. So is I what, think what your argument. I mean, if you go. Every piece of information you pass clandestinely is espionage because the host nation doesn't want you to pass any. Is that the argument you're making? No, sir. So I think the argument that we are making is that spies abuse their protected status as a means of information gathering. The information itself is not necessarily important to that definition of spying. Of course, when Vice Admiral Stockdale wrote the names of all of the prisoners of war that he knew were in the camp, and that was a great thing because we didn't know, you know, however many of them that were in that camp, and so it was the first time that they were alive when he sent that information back. Mm -hmm. The information itself might be praiseworthy, but the method uh, of gathering, say, the targets uh, for the raid on the radio transmitter, the method that they used to gather that was that they were playing as protected, they played on their protected status as prisoners of war to gather that information, and then using that protected status and the information gathered via that protected status to send back to gain military targets to for them, the United States government, to come in and bomb that radio transmitter. But uh, say, sending back the names of your fellow prisoners of war, that wouldn't necessarily be something that you would, that wouldn't have to be information you would gather from the enemy. We believe attempting to communicate uh, falls along the lines of resistance. It is when that communication turns offensive that we would more define it as as, as espionage perfectly and spying. I think, so okay. you can't coordinate. One last question. Yeah. I'm sure. I think so you can't the coordinate question. strikes to the aid and escape. I think you asked that question. Because he was, uh, some of that communication was in support of the planning of an escape That's right. to provide coverage, support, and facilitation. So by that, by your definition, you can't provide any information that will aid in the escape. So that's why we made the key distinction that we weren't saying that the spy in and itself was unethical, right? Because Stockdale and his and company were gaining information to help their lawful and, and ethical and obligatory resistance efforts. However, we are saying that they undertook those actions of their own free will as individuals and that they were in order to do so by the United States military, that it wasn't their military obligation of course, it is their military obligation to resist, such as to try and escape. But gaining information, passing information, uh, using perfidy, abusing their protected status as prisoners of war to gain that information, that was an individual action that they undertook aside from their status as military members. And the information was morally praiseworthy to be used in such a way. So we're not saying that their actions in themselves was unethical, were unethical. We are simply saying that it would have been unethical for them to be ordered to undertake their action, those actions, without their own informed consent and without them understanding that it is an individual choice to do so. All right, I'm going to ask you to think on your feet. <laughs> so, as a POW, do you consider PO? I'm oh, sorry, poorly worded. Do you consider POWs to continue being a combatant? No, we consider them as non-combatants. So they don't have the ability to combat in the way that, um, let's say, if I were to want to coordinate an attack, I don't have free use of my, let's say, 
military weaponry strategy, um, things like I don't have access to the guns or to the training or, or to things like neither, air, neither, air neither do commanders, but they request and send the request out. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the issues that I see as Stockdale was seen was being considered a commander. Mm -hmm. And commanders reach out to organizations to execute missions or perform missions. Mm -hmm. So I, that's why I'm asking you. I think I repeat that's one I think, part, sorry. Yes, I, I think part of this is the balance of force. And I want to clarify and apply that to a commander because if, if we are considering the weapon of the commander to be the brain, which in, in a lot well, of sense, yeah. yes. But if we were to put, we cannot universalize that because that means anytime we see a commander in war, we would have to, they, that means that we could be justified in killing them, whether they're unarmed, wherever they are, because so long as they still have their mind and their training, they are still armed if their chief weapon is their brain. So we're saying that in order to attempt to protect the youth, the standards of the Geneva Convention and protect the spirit of human dignity, we cannot universalize that because then that, that would lead to, well, as long as you still have your hands and your feet, you can kick and punch, that means you're armed, we have to execute you. You may have your hands up, but you can still kick me. I'm, I'm sorry, you're still armed. And I think that's like the key is the balance of force. If we're talking about people that we are capturing that are without that are so far below the spectrum of the escalation of force ladder that we are, then we're not, we cannot justify executing them and still want to protect the Geneva Conventions. So the, the follow on to that is, one of the actions that the North Koreans were attempting to take or to have the American POWs go downtown and on public TV announce that their actions are criminal. So why, you know, I know you went through POW versus spying and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Where do you draw the line between a POW performing the duties of the code as opposed to the actions of the other side indicating criminal, criminal activity? And that's going to carry on through your entire career. So how would you hand, how do you handle the the argument of they're not we're not criminals? I think, I think it's, uh, it lies in the admittance because the value for the North Vietnamese and the North Koreans in the Korean War was not necessarily the actions of the Americans. It was that the Americans admitted to those actions. So obviously, if we're looking at, say, another hypothetical prisoner war case, it's not that I'm going to immediately go admit that I'm writing back home to the CIA. Because, and, but the problem is that the value is not in whether I'm doing it to the North Vietnamese. They wanted us to admit it. They wanted us to admit and go on television and say that I am a war criminal, I am killing civilians, I'm doing these horrible things. And so I think, to answer your question, that doesn't necessarily run into contrast to our argument because the value is not the act. The value, the propaganda value is in our admittance. And, the act, and those two are not required of each other. We do not have to admit on television and that would be a different action than, say, taking part in the clandestine communication. The point you made, propaganda value, is, is exact. All right, I'm going to throw you a real tough question. Can sir, we have about two minutes left for okay. questions. We've been there. All right, I carried grenades on me because I wasn't going to be taken prisoner as a criminal. Mm -hmm. What would you do if you were in Stockfield's boots? The same thing, sir. Yes, sir. I, I think, sir, one thing that we want to be very clear about is that no one is doubting the heroism of these individuals. I think a lot of us would undertake that. That Stockdale did. In fact, we are, I love Stockdale. You know, our citizens have to set up leadership. I think we just wanted to delineate that an unlawful act just has to do more with your protection and your status. In fact, the heroism of Stockdale in knowing that he was giving up his protected status, knowing that he could lawfully be, be executed, is a heroism that I, I would almost uh, equivalent to someone jumping on, on a grenade. So if you remove the CIA, if everything the CIA did was taken out because mm -hmm. of all the one eye and Navy assets that fed everything to them. Would that change the status of any espionage? I wouldn't say it does, so long as they asked him to do it of his own free will, as opposed to ordering him to do so. Okay. Sorry. Uh, these are all great philosophical arguments, mm -hmm. but do you really believe for one minute that the POWs, in the conditions that they found the gave a second thought as to whether or not they were violating the Geneva Convention or the Code of Conduct. Uh, Mike and I 
they have five classmates who were POWs. Fortunately, they all came back. To me, this is much more, uh, I don't get the spying aspect of it. I get the resistance aspect of it. And I'm just interested to know, do you really think that they were, quote, spying in a classical sense? I think part of it comes from the danger. Knowing, and from Vice Admiral Sato's communication saying, knowing that I'm taking on this added danger, I'm taking on this added burden, this added responsibility, simply beyond just a simple resistance effort in the camp. And I think that that's where we get, um, and while they may not have, they may not themselves have defined it as spying, they still recognize, regardless of whatever definition they use, they all recognize that they are taking on an added danger. They are upping the scale of risk to their own health and the health of their fellow prisoners of war. And while I may not have used that specific word, I think that that's what justifies the distinction that we're making. Okay, and that's been 20 minutes of questions, so thank you very much. Round of applause for Navy. Well done. Well done.